Good morning. This is the first Sunday of Advent, and uh, it is a terrific season. It's one of my favorite seasons. And in fact, in the Hula House, it's a big deal to watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And, and just before the dog show comes on, we see Santa Claus on the, on the final float come in. And I think for most of America, that marks the beginning of the official countdown to Christmas. It certainly does for me. I love this season. I, in fact, the Advent season, I, I look at it at a couple different levels. On the first level, one of the things I love about it is it's, it's the holiday season. It's, it's the season when I get to sit by the fireplace and, and drink hot cider and, and see the Christmas classics on TV, and I, and I love that stuff. And I love, I love watching the lights and the, and the decorations go up on houses. In fact, before I moved to Baltimore, I was completely unfamiliar with the institution in Baltimore known as 34th Street in Hamden. And, uh, you know, this is an amazing thing. You gotta love it. If you are, if you are new to the area, find this place. It's, it's a few miles south of here. I, I've read that, it, it, that in the course of the month of December, December, this one block uses more electricity than in the entire state of Wyoming, apparently. And uh, I, I, was, I was ignorant of so many things when I moved to Baltimore. I, I did not know that there was such a thing as a hubcap Christmas tree. That was, that was new to me. And the whole thing about the light up, glow in the dark, purple flamingos with Santa hats built in. I mean, you gotta love Hamden. It's a great place. So that's one level of Advent. I, I love the Christmas season, getting ready for the spirit of the holidays. It's, it's, it's the season of good cheer. But there's a second level of Advent. It's a, it's a more spiritual level. And that's, that's as we prepare for Christmas, as, as we think about the coming of the Christ child, a spiritual time of preparation. And this is, the, this is the season when we're surrounded by reminders of the manger in Bethlehem, where we, where we see little figures of, of Mary and Joseph, where we're reminded of shepherds and, and angels, and, and most significantly of, of the baby Jesus, the Christ child, there in that stable in Bethlehem. It's a time when I get to reflect and think about what it means that God loves us so much that he'd send his son to deliver us. That's a wonderful side of Advent. So there are many, many, many things I love about this season, and I, I hope you do too. But I, I got to confess, December for me as a college professor is the most hectic month of the entire year. Uh, this is the month when I'm trying to wrap up classes. I'm trying to hold review sessions. I'm going to have a group of students over to my house this week. I'm writing final exams. I'm receiving stacks of 15-page term papers that all have to be turned around within a week or two. I've got the final exams that come into grade. And, and you know, frankly, there's just a ton of work in December, and all that work competes with, with other things that I'd like to be doing. And as I get closer to Christmas, well, at some point, the shopping kicks in. And... <laughs> You know, it's, it's, the malls are just absolutely crazy. I, I, I don't know about you, but my to-do list does not get any shorter throughout this month of December. But boy, when you go shopping, the tempers get shorter out there in the stores. In fact, if you're in Best Buy or Target on Black Friday, I mean, it's, it's like a scene out of the Hunger Games. It's, there's nothing to compare it to. And sometimes I find myself entering December and ultimately just wondering, you know, is there... Is there any hope that I'm going to be able to keep my mind on the manger instead of on the mall? Maybe you can identify with that. I think December, in some ways, although it's a wonderful time, can, can be stressful for all of us. I know at, at school, you know, I think about my poor students who are sitting there writing these 15-page term papers and, and the final exams, and I guess that's my fault, isn't it? Sorry, guys, my bad. Um, you know, as December rolls along, a lot of us struggle to dig down into the, into the deeper spiritual meaning of this Advent season. But one trip to the mall can just kidnap our joy. Maybe, maybe some of you are actually coming in today limping from some incident on Black Friday involving big screen TVs, shopping carts, or Elsa dolls before they sold out. I, maybe. Turning on TV doesn't give you a whole lot of a break, even if you're flipping the channels and saying, well, I'll catch It's a Wonderful Life, or I'm going to find Rudolph or Frosty. 
you know, at some point you cross the news channel and, and there you see Syria in a civil war or you see what's going on in Iraq. Or you see the events in Ferguson as, as the grand jury announces its decision and, and protesters take to the streets and storefronts burn. Sometimes we, we try and get a break. We think, let's do something peaceful and let's do something fun. We'll just have a quiet evening. We'll bring in some neighbors. We'll bring in a few friends. We'll have a little holiday get-together. And you know how that goes, right? I mean, first you figure out, oh, no, the crock pot's not heating. And, oh, we forgot the ice. And then the kids start arguing. And then the dog gets out as soon as the first guest comes in. And you spend the next hour trying to chase it down in the neighborhood. And it just doesn't seem that fun. You wonder, what are, what are we doing this all for? We often have this gnawing sense inside that we ought to be focusing on the birth of Jesus instead of the tyranny of the urgent or the, or the shopping lists that haven't gotten take, ticked off yet. But the more frustrated we get because we, we can't find the time to focus on the manger, well, the more frustrated we get, but we don't have much time to think about it. We took a moment a few minutes ago to... Uh, to jot down some things that we're longing for and to, to post them in the, in the stables on either side of the worship center. And I, I want to encourage you, if things come to mind throughout this service, you can do that after the service. You can get up, you can walk over there, you can go during a song, you can post those things that you're longing for. One of the questions I want to think about today is, is there any hope that those longings can, can find a resolution? Is there, is there any hope that those things that we long for and wait for and want in this season of Advent can actually turn around? I think the answer is yes, but I also think that we need to revisit what we look forward to in Advent. I think we need to, to look at God's Word and, and see if we can find some help in getting the big picture for what this season is. I mentioned two ways that, that I often think of Advent, that many of us do. That is the, the holiday season with all the bells and whistles and, and the preparation, the spiritual preparation for the coming of the Christ child, the birth of Jesus. But there's a third and a deeper level of Advent. In the rush of the season, it's, it's pretty easy to forget this one. And yet I think it's the one that has the most potential for, to bring hope for the month of December, but also for our lives. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus. I would never know that the V is pronounced as a W if my eighth grader weren't taking Latin, but he said, no, Dad, it's Adventus, not Adventus. Okay, so be it. It means coming. Advent's not merely a, a look back to the babe in the manger. It's, it's not merely a look forward to the 25th of December but it's a look forward to the work that Christ is doing and has done and will do. A look, a look forward to the work that he'll complete in the future as the king of the world. And there's a reason for hope when you're waiting on a king. Thousands of years before Christ was born, God chose a people. We'll call them Israel. When we, when we use that term in Israel, a lot of times it's, it's a shorthand. It's not necessarily referring to state boundaries in the Middle East right now. It's referring to, to the ancient Hebrew people that we read about in the Old Testament, a people that God intervened in their lives and came into their lives and gave them, gave them his law and spoke to them and gave them promises. And over the centuries, God gradually revealed a series of promises and, and revelations. He unveiled his plan to the people of Israel. And he told them that even though they lived in a broken and a fallen world, there was hope, there was a future. He was making them his people to bring good news and his word to the people of the world. And he pointed towards a focal point in history. He told Israel that there would come a time when a, a Messiah would come, an anointed one, a king would come. And that this king would redeem his people, Israel, but also redeem the world. This would be a king that would rule Israel with perfect justice and with mercy and, and compassion. Advent is about the coming of Christmas. It, it, it is about the babe in the manger. But it's also about the coming of the king. And not just the king of, the, of Israel, but the king of the world. And there's a real reason for hope when you're waiting for this king. 
So let's, let's turn to God's word. Uh, where you're sitting in your seats, if you reach underneath the chair in front of you, you can pull out a red pew Bible and you can follow along as we, as we go through a couple brief texts today. Uh, when you pull it out, we're going to Isaiah chapter 2. And in those red pew Bibles, it's on uh, page 624. Isaiah dates back, this, this dates back more than 700 years before the birth of Christ. And in this particular passage, this is a time when God's chosen people has fallen on hard times. Uh, in fact, this passage looks forward, though, to God's promised future, and that future centers upon a king. So on page 624, Isaiah chapter 2, let's pray and then dive in. Father, you gave this inspiration to your prophet Isaiah a long time ago. And as we look at it, Lord, I pray that you would help us to to see what you were doing in his time, but, but also see what your eternal word has to say to us today. Father, we pray for your Holy Spirit to come upon us, to open our eyes and our minds and our hearts. And we trust, Lord, that as we look here through this passage and through one of the Psalms, you'll speak and you'll reveal yourself and you'll reveal your king. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah chapter 2, starting with verse 1. This is what Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. When Isaiah was writing these words, Israel had fallen on hard times. It was, it was not what it used to be under the great King David or his son, King Solomon. They were surrounded by enemies. The kingdom was falling. There were, there were other religions, many hostile to God's people. And yet, in this context, God tells his prophet, Isaiah, that things are going to change, that there will come a time when the people of the world will look to this mountain, will look to his temple, will look to the true God, that they will stream to worship God. Verse 3, many peoples, notice that there's a plural there, many peoples with an S. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Notice that peoples. That's not the way I talk. I don't, is that the way you talk? Oh yeah, we're having many peoples coming over to our house tonight. No, we say many people. This is translated this way in order to give us a clue that, that the words in this text don't just refer to a lot of folks coming over, but it's, it's pointing out to people beyond Israel. There are peoples, there are tribes, there are tongues, there are nations. The people of the world are going to be coming here to follow God. There's a sense of both yearning and excitement in this passage. It's, there's a desire to hear God's word as it goes out. And there's a promise here that God's word will not only be limited to Israel. It's not going to be limited to one particular place or one particular time or one particular people, but that God's word is, is for everyone and that it's going to go out from Israel and be received. In verse 4, he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. This, this is not primarily talking about some kind of religious pilgrimage where folks just kind of come in and and, you know, pick up a souvenir and head home. This is, this is a journey to submit to a king who is going to rule over the entire world. This promise, this promise points to God's active participation in the lives of people of the world. Look at this, look at this strange promise. He says his word is going to transform these lives. The tools of peace are going to replace the weapons of war. There will come a time where disputes between nations and disputes between people are going to be dealt with by God himself. It's an amazing promise. 
I want to, want to take another short look at a, a, a different Old Testament passage. I want us to flip forward about 100 pages towards the, the front of the Bible to page 518. We're going to look at Psalm 47. It's, it's going to describe some of these same moments, the, the unfolding of history, but it was written 300 years earlier. We get a little bit different angle from the psalmist. So on page 518, Psalm 47. This is an exciting psalm. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy, for the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, the pride of subdued nations under us, people under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy the Lord among the sounding of trumpets. Old Testament scholars look at Psalm 47 and they label it one of the the few coronation psalms or enthronement psalms because this, this psalm, like some of the others, declares God to be the ultimate king, the king of all nations. And it points forward to a time when when God ascends to his throne. And we're going to get that throne language in, in just a few verses But it's a throne where he's going to sit and he's going to rule and reign over the entire world, not just his people. Picking up with verse 6, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. These are words of joy. They're words of triumph. They're words of hope. And there's a reason for hope when you're waiting for a king. God reigns over the nations, verse 8. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Like much of the Old Testament, when we read this, we realize that that the psalmist is pointing back towards things that have apparently already occurred in history, but he's also pointing forward to a fulfillment, to a culmination that has not yet been completely fulfilled when he writes. You see this most clearly in the final verses. The the passage points forward to a time when when the nobles of the nations, not just Israel, the nobles of the nations, would come as the people of God. God's focus was not just on Israel. It was on the whole world. Look at that declaration in the the final verse there. The kings of the earth belong to God. He's the king of nations. He's the high king. He's the king before whom... Every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. This is what we can look forward to in Advent. The ultimate reign of God's anointed one, God's Messiah, the King. The ultimate King who was born in Bethlehem. The King who grew up and became a suffering servant. The King who was crucified and died, and was buried for our sins. And the king who rose victorious from the grave, that's the hope of Advent. That's what we wait for, the coming of the king, the fulfillment of the kingdom. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, maybe you remember that first proclamation. What did he say? He said, the kingdom of God is at hand now. Remember when he went into the synagogue and opened the scrolls and read from the prophets? He read the messianic prophecies. He read about what this coming anointed one, the coming Messiah, the coming king would would do in the world. And then he looks out at an astonished congregation and he tells them, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your presence Here, today. 
That's what we can look forward to. Jesus is not simply the baby in the manger. And he's not merely the rabbi from Galilee. In the words that were taken from Scripture for the Hallelujah Chorus, he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the King of all nations from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. If he's the King of all nations, what does that mean for us? Let's take a few minutes and, and think about the implications. This, this is the very first week of Advent. The rest of Advent stretches out ahead of us. This is not the 26th of December and we're looking back and saying, oh man, we blew it again. This is just the right time to think about what the king has to say. Scripture declares that Jesus is not just the king, he's the king of everybody. He's the king for everyone. And that includes me. And it includes you. One of the things that Israel could not quite imagine is that this king who would be the king over the world was not going to be a king because he, he conquered the other nations, but he was going to be the king of the world because he would invite other nations to come to him, to follow him, that he would throw open the gates and invite everyone to come in and recognize him as the king. And he's extending that invitation to us. It's an extraordinary invitation. And it's an invitation to us that we can live in his kingdom and under his reign right here and right now. Advent's not just about the lights of Hamden or the cider or the fireplace or the packages or the presents or even the Black Friday train wrecks. Uh, you, you all know that already, right? But it's also not just about the baby in the manger. It's about the coming and the rule and the reign of Christ the King because the baby grows up. And that manger, that manger is not just a cradle. It's the gateway to the kingdom of God. And there's reason for hope when we're waiting on a king. So we need to look beyond the manger to the throne as well. There's a, there's a reason for hope this season. Because, actually, you know, we've got more hope than the shepherds had that first night. You know, the shepherds had this amazing invitation. The shepherds were invited. They, they could come and they could behold the newborn Savior in the, in the cradle. And, and boy, I kind of wish I'd been there. I really do. What a thrill. But do you realize our invitation's even greater than that? We're not told, look, you got a ticket for a one-night event. We're told that we can walk through our lives with Jesus walking with us every single day that we're on this earth and beyond. That's amazing. It's not just Christmas Eve. How does that matter? Let me offer three suggestions for this Advent season. Three ways that, that maybe it makes a difference that we see Jesus as king. When we intentionally recognize Jesus as the king, he helps us see the idols in our lives. And by idols, I'm, I'm talking about our misplaced priorities. There are things that we value. But in Advent, we're reminded that history is heading towards a conclusion. And that God is intimately involved in it. And this conclusion that God is bringing history towards is so much bigger than any of our political or economic aspirations. It reminds us that there's an end of the world. There's a, there's a beginning to something that's more, so much more that, that we can't begin to really imagine it as it is. And so when we see Jesus as the king, we're brought into a time of questioning. And we ask, why do we hold so tightly onto the, the things and the, the stuff that ultimately can't follow us into the future? I think there's a, a second thing that, that Advent confronts in us and that a, a big vision of Jesus as a king confronts in us. And that's relying 
only on ourselves and not on God when we're facing the challenges and the problems of life and, and of this season. The picture we have in Scripture is a picture that, that God is ultimately in control of history. And that includes our lives. He's at work right now. Christ is the king. And ultimately, he makes whole all the broken little pieces of our lives. And he brings joy and he brings justice to the earth. Christmas season is unfortunately a season where we more acutely feel loss and pain. Our grief seems deeper in this season. The threat of illness seems worse to many of us in this season. Our loneliness seems to ache harder during this season. But if the holiday season sometimes makes us feel our losses more, Advent holds out hope because the king who came promises that his spirit will never leave us or forsake us. In Advent, we talk about waiting on God, but remember, God waits on us too. When I say God waits on us too, I don't, I don't mean like, you know, the parental kind of waiting like, you know, don't you have your shoes on yet? I thought I told you to get your coat on. Come on, we're late. We're gonna, you know, or deal with it. Just apologize to your brother. We've got to go. Not that kind of waiting. The kind of waiting that only trusted friends have for us. The kind of waiting where when we're in grief or pain or longing, our friend just stands quietly next to us and says, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere, I'm here with you, no matter how long this takes. This king waits with us. The world ends and the God who controls it all waits for us, and a time comes when he will wipe away every, every tear from our eyes. There is a reason for hope when you're waiting on this king. And we can know him now. We can experience some of that peace and joy even now. I think there's a, there's a, a third way that, that thinking about Jesus as king can draw us into Advent in a, in a more powerful way. And that's through active waiting. It's so easy to talk about the fact that, you know, God's ultimately going to fix everything so I don't have to worry about it and just sort of move on with life. But when you turn on the news and you see the aching in the world, when you see world hunger, when you see violence, when you see discrimination, when you see pain, when you see things that just should not be, we're called to more than saying, thank you God that at some point there will be no more hunger. Okay, let's turn the channel. We're called to wait actively. We're called to join Jesus. He calls us to more than that. We're called to join him in what's on his heart and to think about what we can do as the body of Christ. And imagine what we can do together as the body. The problems of this world are not all going to disappear until Christ comes again. That's just the way it is. But until then... As the body of Christ, we are an outpost of his kingdom. We're called to wait actively, working with him. So as a church, we don't merely thank God that one day things will be better and move on. We give. When we look at world hunger, we give of our surplus. When we look at world hunger, we contribute food and we contribute funds we think about alternative gifts that we can give. Donating a goat for a family someplace around the world where that simple gift is going to make a tremendous difference in the way that their lives look. We draw the attention of our policymakers to the things that the world needs now. We give of our time to staff shelters for the hungry and the homeless for abused women and children. We, we mentor young children so that the cycle of poverty, at least in their lives, may end for some. We don't just wait. We join God. And we carry the good news that he proclaims, 
the good news of our righteous king. And we do this because we have hope. And there's reason for hope when you're waiting for the king. For the next few Sundays in Advent, we're going to be remembering that Jesus came to be king and that this kingdom is for everyone and that includes you. So let's go into Advent armed with that hope. Join me as we pray. Gracious God, we thank you for coming, for humbling yourself and coming as a, as a human that could walk and feel and experience and see hunger and see pain and, and know those things. We thank you, though, that ultimately we can look forward to your reign as king of the world, of all of us. Lord, you are the king for everyone. I pray that as we go through Advent, you would shape our thoughts and shape our lives and shape our actions just as you shape our ultimate destinies. Guide us, Lord. Help us to know the hope that is real and found in you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.